we do have a historical kind of presence everywhere in the state. And um, they are always looking for, for answers and, and their needs are huge. And they are approaching many different organizations. And that's happening like uh, whenever they see the name in Spanish, hacer means to do. Hello and uh, welcome back to this week's episode of the TF Cast. I'm your host, Willis Stout. Hey, Grum here. It is April 29th. Or no, that is totally wrong. It is April 26th here in the Solarium. And I am your host, Jacob Basis. Today, we are so pleased to introduce Rodolfo, Daisy, and Ruben of Hacer. They are a research and advocacy group for Hispanic people in the region. Please, if you could, Rodolfo, just let the audience know what your group is about and what you intend to do here in the southern Minnesota region. Oh, certainly. And first and foremost, thank you for inviting us to come and talk to you and your audience. And um, well, my name is uh, Rodolfo Gutierrez, and um, I am originally from Mexico, and I came here to Minnesota to study for five years, my goal, and that it's been 26 years ago. So I stayed here. I'm regretting it every winter. <laughs> <laughs> like every winter, I hate it. So, um, but yeah, uh, since uh, 2007, working for ACER as the executive director, which I enjoy deeply. Um, and uh, because the ACER is an organization very singular, it's a nonprofit that was created initially as a program for CLUES. Back in time, it was com com uh, Chicanos Latinos Unidos en Servicio, like Chicanos Latinos United in Service. Mm. Today is Comunidades Latinas Unidas en Servicio, which is community, uh, Latino Communities United in Service. Um, they wanted to create some sort of space for answering the deep questions of, of how we can do better if I do have these problems within the community. So uh, they created this program to offer some options in research and evaluation and later on in outreach in order to create some sort of um, elements for the community to use in their own advocacy approaches. So that is why we are ACER, Hispanic Advocacy and Community Empowerment through research that uh, in 1997 became a nonprofit. So as an independent organization first, we were hosted by the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis campus. And then we moved out from there and we were hosted by the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. And finally, we are uh, ourselves in our offices, headquarters in St. Paul. Um, our objective is always working with um, the Latino communities in Minnesota and beyond. We've been holding projects, uh, research projects that are following migrants from Texas to Minnesota and backwards. We've been following migrants going from Seattle to Maine and backwards, being all them Latinos. And uh, obviously we focus in Minnesota in the areas where the Latino population is more dense. Uh, obviously, Twin Cities, but uh, recently we came uh, to Mankato and opened an office a space here for us to have more proximity to the, to the area of Mankato, where we do have a lot of concentration, but also we are connected with areas that are key particularly whenever you think about uh, the upcoming agricultural season. Mm. So uh, we do have a lot of uh, uh, seasonal workers that are either international mi migrants or uh, migrants from other states uh, in the country, or even people living here in, in Minnesota that create some sort of different issues in, in the state. And beyond, I repeat, because we are working in Iowa and uh, the Dakotas and uh, in Wisconsin, uh, and we try to uh, recognize what they do feel, what they do want, and create uh, research approaches to have answers for them that they can use, I repeat, for themselves in creating uh, solutions to the problems. So what I'm gathering from that is that a lot of this research that is done actually empowers people to make changes for themselves like you know you can't make a p case for yourself without being able to prove that um so how is it that you you find yourself able to track these people do they all opt in or how do you actually like do the boots on the ground stuff <laughs> well i can i can start and i guess uh, either ruben or or daisy are going to also add but 
they, they are everywhere. I mean, uh, 26 years ago when I came here to Minnesota, it, it was really hard to find a taco store or even a Latino grocery store. Mm. Today, you can see them everywhere. But since uh, Latinos are living in Minnesota, starting in 1885, for the first time they were counted Latinos in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. They were two only, but they were mm -hmm. Latinos. Mm -hmm. So um, later on, um, big communities of Latinos start to create some sort of their own spaces. One of the first ones in West St. Paul, which is still alive today, mm -hmm. but then a lot of migration. And you know, here in the area of Makedo, there is a lot of... Uh, beet fields. So in 1920s, uh, the beet attracted a lot of people to come and work in here. And then uh, by the 40s with the war and the Programa Bracero, Bracero program, uh, a lot of Latinos came also to this area. That said, is uh, we do have a historical kind of presence everywhere in the state. And um, they are always looking for, for answers and, and their needs are huge. And they are approaching many different organizations. And that's happening like uh, whenever they see the name in Spanish, hacer means to do. So uh, then when they see the name, they are uh, immediately linking that with something they need to. Or they want to have some orientation as to what to do. Mm -hmm. And then they approach to us. But also we are always looking for um, organizations who want to do something with us. So we survive with grants from foundations. We have contracts with the government of the state, but we also have partnerships with other organizations like who are working with the communities like COPAL, for example, at same Clues or many others statewide. And um, that is how people are coming to us. And that's how we go to the people trying to find out what they do need. Mm. Um, and what do the two of you do in relation to the organization? We've got the executive director, and what are your roles? Ladies first. Okay, so my name is Daisy Canyon. I am the Sauder um, Community Outreach Coordinator. Um, so what I do is connect with people, uh, participate in different events where I know a Latino Hispanic community is going to participate in order to let them know what programs we have and also to talk to them and know and learn about their specific needs. You know, uh, ACER has been located for many years in the San Paul area, but we want to start reaching uh, the South area because we know that there are a lot of Hispanic and Latino community there that is growing. Mm -hmm. And we, I, and in my case, I understand that the needs that people from the Latino Hispanic community had in the cities are different from the needs or experiences that people have here in the rural area. So. Mm -hmm. Um, my job is not only let them know about our organization, but also talk to them and um, let them know what they really need or what are their specific needs in order to um, offer them or create the program, you know? So, for example, I have been having the experience to talk with a lot of parents that have been um, um, telling me about bullying experiences in schools, that the reason why I start to lead in a project on bullying uh, for the Latino Hispanic community here in this area. So, um, yeah, the idea is that they also let us know what they need because uh, what we want through research, and this is something that I always highlight to people when I am doing outreach, is that we need to hear from them, you know? Uh, that's the only way we can do something. If they didn't participate in our research, if they didn't let them know as what they need is going to be hard to find a solution. So uh, I, I consider myself like a bridge, you know, between okay. uh, the organization and then, and also another organizations and trying to find founders that want to join us and make changes mm -hmm. and maybe offer a better life and opportunities for the Latino Hispanic community here in this area. Well, I'm Ruben Gonzalez, and I'm working as a public health program coordinator. And for the past two years, we support a lot the COVID situation in the state. We're doing some vaccination clinics in the Twin Cities and the rural communities, as well supporting the testing clinics. You know, it was a big pandemic, something that changed our life. So we support the, the their needs for 
of course it was open for all the community we support a lot the latino community as well and also hearing that needs for the latino communities like they don't know how to access to health resources in case they got covid or what kind of a uh, medication could take you know and yeah it was a big challenge for us and we have the help of the mdh the minnesota department of health also by myself i am an asset we working with the counties and we have a project with anoka county trying to connect the latino community with the resources that the county have right now like um they have like different resources that everybody can apply, but they don't know where to find it, this Latino community. Mm -hmm. So we, we're working together, joining our efforts to find them and evaluate the, their needs for having better resources to them. Yeah. Okay. Um, a little bit earlier, it was mentioned, um, it just kind of as a segue, how long you had been operating in the St. Paul area and what some of your motivations might have been to come here. Could someone just go over what some of the impacts in that area have been and what some of the things that might be of importance that you see so far to happen in this area and um, what that could mean also for the people within the Latino group and, um, you know, for, you know, just other people who live here. Well, I can start and maybe again, uh, Daisy and Ruben can say something else. But yeah, first, first and foremost, uh, we've been working from the beginning at statewide. So the goal is to work with uh, the entire communities. And this is um, something I always keep in mind because the first project I uh, led when I joined ACER, it was uh, an assessment of needs uh, of the migrant community uh, in Minnesota. And uh, we work also in North Dakota back in time. And that is uh, a very intensive and really uh, consuming time of time work I mean, that took us all over around. I, I never knew about Fargo until the movie. So uh, when the, the Cohen's brother movie came out, I watched it and uh, I had the opportunity to go to Fargo for the first time when I was started to work in, 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 in Nasser. And, um, but I learned a lot about uh, the differences that Daisy was uh, uh, highlighting. There are many different communities. So um, with that project only, we did uh, created a lot of um, knowledge on how the migrant families are coming to the state, what they are, that they are coming both legally and undocumented, and that they are coming with the entire family moving from Texas to Minnesota for the season, and that they have specific needs in education, housing, uh, uh, driving, all that transportation. So with the Department of Education back in time, we created some sort of program for the department to establish some ways to bring those resources to the people who are migrant or seasonal workers here. So the, the first impact I saw is like everybody had it uh, when they arrived to Minnesota, that book in their hands with the information we gathered and how they could also use it on their favor. Along the time, we've been doing our, our different projects. I, I have a special bond with uh, one that it is on uh, education needs for Latinos in Minnesota, but based on the assets we do have as a community, because uh, there are some projects like one in, in Northfield in Minnesota uh, that still today is very successful in following up the students from the beginning in the kindergarten till they go to college. And they help people to go to college to... Um, in the area, Carlton College or Sinola. But uh, other examples that have been taking place, like here nearby in Sleepy Eye, uh, for two years, it was like the graduation rate went up to 80%. But after the person who was leading that project went down again to 30% graduation rates. Um, so we tried to figure out what can be a good program to put it in place more everywhere around or generally applied. And we developed uh, these kind of um, recommendations on what are the steps you need to follow to establish a successful program with Latino students. And it is in every single um, library in the schools in the state of Minnesota. So you can consult it and you can see what it's working or not. And I see 
happily that there are a couple of schools. One it one of them here in um um what is the name of the city, St. Peter, um, that it is uh, working with that model and having a lot of success. And uh, we do have some, some other examples. So we are impacting in so many ways uh, with the, our work to the communities. And uh, the way we work also is with the key actors. So people like uh, peasants or uh, meatpacking industry workers or drivers, because we've been working with a uh, trailer drivers and all that uh, are talking to us and they then we are developing the tools they need and uh, it's everywhere and they are calling us today for more information now i have to say uh, with the pandemic coming i say also was more in on demand <laughs> mm. today we are holding 27 different projects at once for the first time in our history mm. before it was more like Slow down, yeah, <laughs> take <yeah>. it easy. <laughs> but today, 27 projects, different projects uh, at Dang. once. So we needed to really establish our commitment with more people on board. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. How, how big is your team now? We have uh, 18 people as a staff members plus consultants because now we need some consultants who are giving us some help. In total, we had up to 24 people. Hmm. And in the past, until... 2019, we were always fluctuating between one and four people working for the organization. <laughs> yeah. So what what changed on that? You mentioned it was a big response to the pandemic, but did it uncover <clears throat> did it uncover new challenges, um, um, oppor opportunities maybe for an organization like yours to have a big impact? Um, yes, yeah, certainly. And uh, one of the main issues is like we. I'll say that it's like we've been there all the time. Everybody's looking at us, but the the needs are not that kind of urgent mm -hmm. at that at along that time. Sure. But when the pandemic comes, it's uh, like the realization that that community is there and it has special needs. Mm. So uh, organization well, it's like a boom, like a uh, boom. Oh, said is here. You know? Yeah. <laughs> mm. And organizations such as the Minnesota Historical Society, we didn't have the opportunity before to work with. They mm. call us and say, can you do a research on what ha is happening in Lake Street, for mm. example? And then Mankei Area Foundation calls, can you help us? And they in identifying the people who's being affected by the COVID, mm -hmm. uh, who is Latinos, of course. So all of a sudden, that kind of questions emerge and in the context of the emergency situation we were going through. And um, they start to call us. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, because I'm without getting into the details why some of this community might be uh, left behind on certain government initiatives and other things like that, I wonder if you can uh, speak to speak to someone who might feel themselves um, left out of the conversation or unaware of what, what's going on even and wondering how they can just on a practical level get connected with either an organization like yours or or the programs that your organization offers, like uh, what what changes does an individual have to make to become exposed to those sorts of things? Is it, is it an asking? Is it a calling? Is it how how are you how are you connecting with folks? Well, that is a very tough question. Mm -hmm. um, I guess uh, we do have a singular situation here in Minnesota, well, in, in mm -hmm. the entire yeah. country, with a lot of stigmas behind. Uh, how you conceptualize, how you visualize a la, a, to, to the Latino community. Mm. And um, those stigmas also are very heavy on uh, the shoulders of those who are in this side of the of the fence, like mm. being Latinos for ourselves, and, and Ruben can also testify that, and, and uh, Daisy experienced it. We come from countries where we are not Latinos. Mm. We are Mexicans, Colombians, we are Venezuelans. Then we come here and we receive the need of establishing that label because we need to identify ourselves as Latinos. Mm -hmm. When we go through that way, so we also being asked as, uh, what is your race? Mm -hmm. And um, it's a very tough questions we never ask in our countries. So we don't have that kind of approach ever, mm -hmm. for even for census purposes. And then um, when you come here, then you start seeing yourself like different from the rest of the population. Even even uh, 
brothers and sisters from the black community, they do have that category there clearly identified. Even African American or whatever it is, is there for our brothers and sisters from the Asian community, they are there. But Latinos, we are not fully there because we are Latinos, but also we need to be some, something else. Mm. And that also comes together with the fact that um, we are um, coming from a lot of different groups. Like we do have people who are coming to Cargill or to 3M or, or universities to work in a very high positions and very well educated. But we also have people who are working from Ecuador, mm. literally speaking, walking. Oh, up to here, because there is a big network. Mm. So that said, uh, you cannot also see yourself like uh, the Equatorian who came here, like the same way as uh, the Colombian who's working for uh, cargo. So you don't see that uh, kind of uh, difference. difference. Mm. Yeah. Or, or, or rather, you see the difference. You cannot see the compatibility with being Latinos mm. the same way. So that is uh, creating some sort of, um, say, um, you, you, you put yourself apart if you are not that educated person and you hide yourself and then, then uh, you need to change that kind of perspective and try to lose that fear because there are say those options here in this country for you to not fear, even though there isn't too much to fear about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but if you start feeling less uh, in that disadvantage, you can start creating more approaches and more ways to ask the right people, the Organizations, so I'm going to say it again, Copal, like uh, there is in, in Worthington, a big organization, Unidos, Minnesota, and there are so many others like uh, Clues who are working also in the area uh, that can serve and uh, approach you to the resources. But people are afraid of asking. So we are still having that stigma. And I, I don't know in your own experiences, you guys, if you have anything else to say. Daisy. Yeah, I will say that, um, as Rodolfo was mentioning, it's really hard to put in a only category the Hispanic Latino community, and that's why it's really important to... Um, I've been open to understand the difference and see mm. the difference, because difference means richness, you know? Mm. And the difference is when we are going to find um, what this person can provide me. So um, that's why I consider in my job, it's really important to um, approach people and then let them know what they need. Because most of the time when we approach as a researcher, it's like a we know we are gonna, uh, like you are the object of a study, but we don't let them be part of the study. And I think that this is key here in our organization is mm. let people work with us in order to find a result and resolve the issue of the problem by mm. considering the difference that we see as a Latinos, you know, because we can see this difference. And even when we are categorized like Latinos, as Rodolfo said, I didn't think about being a Latina before was in Colombia, I was Colombian, but I didn't think about race or I consider myself Latina until I get here. But it's understand that every single person had a different background, different experience, but also from this experience, they had something to um, provide to me in order to grow as a community. Mm -hmm. I think that this is something that it is important to emphasize here is that, um, like we know in this area, most of the population are, are, are white, but they can join us as an organization in order to create a better community because we need to recognize that the Latino Hispanic community is growing in the area and they had a lot of things to provide to the community in order to be better, you know? So that's the idea. We want to hear the voices and also respect these voices. We don't want to uh, know what they need. We really want to keep and offer what they really need okay what sort of uh in i was gonna say integration efforts but that's maybe the wrong word and you can feel free to correct me there but what sort of um things uh programs help um an area like i know you mentioned to the cities being different from rural so i'm curious kind of about this area specifically southern minnesota mankato um what sort of initiatives, things that 
uh, either need to be created anew or things that already exist but just need to be better supported can really help help uh, foster the positive relationships and like you said uh, like you know, greater becoming greater than the sum of the parts rather than diluting the experiences of a whole group, bringing them in and um, supporting their long-term vision with the area. Well, I can start again. And there, there are different organizations who are doing different things. And I guess that is mm -hmm. a, the main kind of objective or the main way to do it. Okay. Um, in that sense... Uh, for example, the Department of Economic and um, the Department and Economic Development, the DIT in Minnesota, is trying to work in this area in particular. Based in Mankato, they do have a big office to identify uh, who are these people who are working in the fields and in, in the meatpacking industry. Uh, myself, I I'm part of the Governor's Commission on um, uh, Agricultural Workers for the state of Minnesota, and this work is kind of bringing a lot of information for the state in general, the government, to um, talking about what are, the, what are the main needs that these people have. Uh, so that is the first step I say is important to take. Recognize that population. Mm. Identify them where they are, look at them, how they are living right now, and try to uh, figure out then where you are going to be ch channeling the the them to, to solve the, their needs. Mm. Second, um, there is a, a big effort coming out from the uh, Minnesota State University in Mankato that is leading this big uh, networking system where people are coming and talking about this. So uh, mm. I do work with a community that has these kind of problems who can help. And because it's a very diverse network, so you can find people representing offices of the government or uh, uh, different organizations that are even private initiatives that are trying to solve these problems and they are learning about this and offering their services. Mm -hmm. So that is a very wonderful effort that it is taking place here. And this is a model. I mean, there are no many other places in, 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 in Minnesota like this one mm -hmm. that you can follow. And also the big commitment that colleges and you know, other universities here in the area like uh, Southwest College, uh, South, sorry, Southeast College and um, Riverland, it's Riverland, 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 Riverland College. College. Mm. They are trying to engage with the Latino communities openly and creating this kind of um, channel of communication from there to here mm. to distribute the information to the right uh, organizations that can help. Mm. So I guess we need to support those kind of, of issues and also create a way to educate both segments of the population in this particular situation the Latino communities on one side that they are resources and they are there for you. Mm -hmm. You need to approach and ask for them. And the other side is like that community is important. Mm. And it's important because remember in the last census, one fourth of the growth of the population is due to the Latino communities. Mm. So it is important because um, the Latino communities are the youngest kind of um, population in the state while the white population is growing in uh, elders. So we are going to be in much need of professionals. We need to create that professionals coming out from our own towns. Mm. And th those are going to be the Latinos. And they are very important because, say, they are Latinos and they know how to dance and they mm. know, know how to cook. The tacos are delicious, <laughs> so you cannot <laughs> deny that. And <laughs> the cultural aspect is very important. Mm -hmm. So that cultural enrichment is really important. And that's why we need to work with education in both sides. I think it's really, I mean, I don't know where these resources actually are for, you know, like white folks, because and maybe that's half the reason why we're here is because I think when a lot of times the media talks about these, these situations, they, they talk about a group of people coming from somewhere and they don't talk about how much we depend on them. Um, like I've never seen a conversation, um, just like a, you know, one of those like headline grabs where they're talking about, um, immigrants and they're saying like our our economy i don't believe it could survive like we wouldn't have cheap juice and fruit and all the things that like we just appreciate a lot of them they come from this kind of labor and we we depend on it um and i i don't i don't really see that that information coming out 
or the value. Like, I don't know. I, I don't like it when people say like illegal immigrant because like we need those people to do the things that they do. You know, they, they get reclassified into something that, that isn't, that isn't true necessarily. Um, and I, I don't see where some of those resources are, or, I mean, I guess maybe just the media doesn't reflect that back towards the white people who are often making the decisions. Um, that was, that was going towards a question. Um, <laughs> but it, I, I guess it, bringing these, bringing this, this information forward, I, I would hope gets that information into some of those people's hands. Um, yeah. How do you change the narrative and, and, or um, maybe not, how do you, how do you see the narrative of kind of what Jacob mentioned where like the, a lot of what the news is, is focusing on certain perceived negatives around some of these like immigration challenges. It's all a very um, negative conversation. And how do you see, um, how do you frame that either internally or how do you see the narrative changing towards a more positive approach? Well, first, I think um, I, I was mentioning before there are several stigmas in how to yeah. identify these Latino communities. Uh, but also, I guess uh, we need to promote more knowledge about it. As if you see today the statistics about Latinos in, in Minnesota, over 70% of them are U.S. born citizens. And uh, from the remaining 28%, we do have over 60% of them uh, transiting into the citizenship. That means they are going through the proper ways to be citizens. Mm -hmm. From the others who are immigrants working here temporarily or under student visas, the proportion of undocumented in the census is so, so low. It's very, very low. Mm -hmm. So that we can start changing that. I mean, most of the people who are Latinos, we are not undocumented. Mm -hmm. And then just uh, that, I hope, can help in making less heavy the condition of being an undocumented. Because when you are undocumented and, and, and you have to deal with those stigmas that you are illegal and therefore you are wrongly here in this country, mm -hmm. it's not helping. We are conducting a research on uh, what it is the impact of the undocumented workers in Minnesota, in this area particularly. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are finding very amazing stops because while the, the number might be uh, low, a uh, very small number, uh, the impact is huge because they are those agricult agricultural people who are bringing the, the orange to your food or are, they are bringing the, the, the corn to your mm -hmm. to your table they are uh, doing all that job that you see daily basis on your table mm -hmm. so without that you are not doing well i mean you need that to mm -hmm. survive and that is coming from uh, brown hands and they are doing that work so if you can really remove that stigma that every latino is undocumented and see what the undocumented and documented workers here in the state are doing yeah. for our economy, for our lives and ourselves daily, I guess that's going to start changing. I remember a Chiquita Banana commercial bringing that up front in the mm -hmm. 70s. I saw it as I am a historian, so we work with it in, in my class because I talked at you. And um, there was a, not even was filmed here in Makedo. Mm -mm. Yeah, curiously. And um, they were <clears throat> sitting at the table at the moment of lunch, and they were bringing all what they were going to be eating. And the dad was talking, you know, that was made by a Mexican hand. That was made by a Honduran hand. And that was made by, I don't know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And at the end, Chiquita employs a lot of hands that are bringing the richness to your food. Mm -hmm. So that kind of uh, commercial was banned very mm -hmm. almost immediately. But that kind of information is important to really distribute it along the population because that way you can understand what it is the real impact that this community is having in your daily life. And therefore, you can start changing your your narrative. Yeah. And that is important also for the other way around. I mean, yeah. Yeah. you can start changing the, the, your own perception to change the narrative. Yeah, uh, my auntie immigrated here from Mexico and she... Uh, she was a dentist down there. And when she uh, moved here, 
her skills as a medical interpreter were she was basically needed in the community to do it well before like all of her documentation and like actually marrying my uncle and all that went through so i think there's another side of it where it's like it's uh uh, I, I think just the image that someone gets when, the, when they hear an undocumented worker is is only like things like that when it can be all sorts of important roles in your community for sure. Right. I mean, additionally, throughout this conversation, we've talked about this area and people coming to here. And a lot of this we see through the frame of the United States economy, because that's how we talk mostly in the news. But a lot of these things... Um, end up having large impacts outside of our country um, or outside of America. Like, for example, you know, Starbucks buying up all kinds of fields to grow coffee. You know, they're offering an exorbitant sum of money um, to a, a farmer for their land, but that money dries up in a generation, and then all of the wealth is pulled out of that country, um, and it comes here where it stays. And there's a, there's a barrier in between that wealth and the people who enjoy it. Um, I mean, I, I think that that's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. But it's also something that, that you know, we don't talk about. Um, because, you know, like that cheap labor or, or that land that makes all of this convenience for us, it, it really does, it, it to some degree traps people behind that convenience. Like they can't come here and experience the fruits of their labor the way I get to just by birth lottery. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I would like to see or know if there's any kind of information that comes to the, the other side, you know, like, what, does it, does it go all the way back to the communities people have come from, um, some of this research? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, first, uh, you, you made me remember one experience I did go through with an Ecuadorian, uh, farmer. He was a farmer in his own town. He came here to work as a agricultural picker here for the season. And uh, he was telling me that uh, he moved here because a U.S. company came to his town, took the land, and pushed them out. So mm -hmm. he just was expelled from his own land. So he mm -hmm. came here with all what he knew and started working here. And he was asked to use some fertilizers, machinery, and all the stuff to produce big uh, number of products mm -hmm. and he said that it, that is not natural so it is uh, the way i did that in my land it was different with my own hands and with my anim animals and all that and uh, at the end um he said uh now he's been asked to consume organic products mm -hmm. and he says i did that in my country when i mm -hmm. came here i was pushed to eat mcdonald's which i hate she, mm -hmm. he said and um now they are asking me to eat the way I was eating there in, in Ecuador, but I cannot afford it mm. because organic is very expensive here. So um, that said is, uh, like, for example, Magnite Foundation has a program on um, disseminating these kind of stories. And we shared that uh, story with uh, Magnite, and Magnite published it in their own website, and they do have a lot of other experiences like that, like those, and, and just mm. handle it to the people. And I guess um, whatever we've seen is that uh, particularly foundations who are supporting us, but all other organizations are promoting our results. Uh, recently, I uh, was delighted when I saw CDC Foundation uh, posting a video where our work, they were talking about the work we do. Uh, Ruben was in charge of uh, doing the outreach for this project on CDC uh, and we were posted there like an organization who's bringing uh, amplifying the voices of Latinos in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So I, I was really, really happy to see that. And I guess that can help in, in um, informing mm -hmm. better the people through those channels. Because I, I was saying before, I, I talked at the University of Minnesota and I was surprised how the education here uh, limits a lot of, um, I don't know, access to information to the point in which... Uh, I remember I was teaching U.S. history and I was talking about the Seneca Falls movement in the 1900s for the rights of women and all that. And um, a student from um, Winona came and said, we never talk about that in high school. 
Mm. So you are teaching me the dark side of the history of the United States. Mm. And that is something real. I mean, and, and the school system is not necessarily highlighting those part of the difficult uh, transit in the history of the United States. Therefore, mm -hmm. you cannot really see uh, other ways, like everything is okay. Yeah. And what it is not okay is bad. And it's not okay if you come without documents, so you are bad. Mm. And things like that. So it is, from my perspective, a very simplified uh, kind of version, but uh, yeah. talks about how complicated it is to change that narrative. It's it's another it's another issue that I I'm always kind of banging the drum on of how schools and school boards are actually some of the most um, accessible grassroots political places, and that can be both good and bad because a lot of people who have fairly extreme political agendas, often right wing, um, will make a lot of astroturfing going on, giving information to parents of things that just really aren't happening. And say like, hey, go to your school board meeting and make a lot of noise about this. Um, you know, we we've even had we've had teachers on this show who were just harassed by yeah, these yeah. people. Mm -hmm. um, and it, what ends up in like a American history or like what's taught in our schools is really um, the the basis of a lot of the political education that people end up getting. Um, and like the, we had some really high profile stuff happen in the last few years. I know like the, what's that silly report that Trump tried to, like the 1619, <laughs> yeah. it was, it was just, it was just ridiculous. I don't know if anyone remembers the thing, um, the process. What, yeah. I don't remember right now. Oh uh, yeah. Well, it's not around anymore. It doesn't matter. Um, we're smarter <laughs> than that here. We just, we don't even remember what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it, it it's a uh, it's cool to hear that that's what's going on. Can you, um, Ruben, talk a little bit maybe about the work that you did with that CDD, CDC project? Yeah, sure. It's um, it's getting involved a little bit with uh, COVID and dissemination of the uh, all the pandemic stuff. Uh, we were involved of uh, sharing information with the community about the the new vaccines, the different kind of vaccine that that the government have available. Mm -hmm. uh, every update that come from, for example, when that come up, up come up with the ch for the children's available the vaccines for six months and up, and then the long COVID, like what happened after I got COVID, and yeah, it was kind of interesting and a challenge explaining to the community in a not too much technical uh, language to them like to they could understand better the the yeah you know the meaning of the of this covid to take care of them a little bit mm -hmm. and like i i want to add ruben is kind of uh, modest because he organized big uh, events uh, with community gatherings and also uh, with uh, partnering with other organizations to deliver that information uh, while we were also uh, offering vaccines to the people. So he was uh, collecting a lot of um, partnerships to make of these uh, big events. And that's why we were portrayed by the CDC Foundation. And you see in that video, Ruben not on this, mm -hmm. distributing some information and, and, and testing kits to the people as we were having this vaccination event. So he uh, organized several events in this uh, with the support of CDC Foundation. Yeah, so we do fair resources, health, health resources first to the Latino mm -hmm. community and we're doing some partnerships with, like example, Prairie View Clinic, Children's, and different kind of um, other clinics to offer free resources in that moment to pediatrics, health, health basic uh, health checkups, mm -hmm. uh, blood pressure, diabetes, uh, of course, vaccines, incentives if you get vaccines, like a big, big information to the Latino community. Because what I, after working in the past two years in the field with the community and hear their needs, it's, I don't know where to go if I get sick, even if I'm legal here or not, uh, I'm scared because I don't, first, I don't speak Spanish. Second, I don't know where to go. And third, uh, 
it's more that fair, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I prefer to stay home and take a Tylenol, mm -hmm. and that's it. And probably you need more and uh, something more yeah. specific. And the yeah, that kind of needs, and that's why we design and um, move in this uh, section of health to all the Latino community. And yeah, we started having a lot of assistance. Actually, we have one the next uh, 21st of May in Dakota Lunch it's in West St. Paul. Okay. Um, and this information, like after you do the research, where does it get made available? Are papers published or do you have a media outlet or anything like that? Or is it just kind of sent to where it needs to go? We have a monthly news e-newsletter and also... Um, we have Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, don't forget to follow us too. <laughs> As yeah. And we have our connections in different uh, communities. Also, we connect a lot with Somali, Somali communities, uh, from Americans, Asians, and white population as well to help us to connect with more community, to get more assistance, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to your question, yes, we do publish uh, the documents. We print them out if needed, but they are all available in our website at acer-mn.org, and we do have all the publications we do have available in uh, digital format. But we also create what it is a uh, uh, little one-page information from the projects that we distribute broadly. If you visit our office here in Mankato with Daisy, you'll see several of them there posted in the, the walls, but we do have them available also either digitally or printed. And we deliver the reports to the organizations who are supporting us and the organizations we are working with. And finally, we, like, not less before coming, I was having a meeting because we are going to have a conference presentation in Ohio, where we are going to be talking about a beautiful project we are conducting with children in the school. So um, we do all kind of ways to disseminate. Social media also is kind of a way for us to talk about these uh, products, these um, publications or reports. Mm -hmm. This episode is sponsored by Beers, Brats, and Bourbon. You are cordially invited to raise a glass and raise awareness of youth hunger in our communities. Join Feeding Our Communities partners at their annual Beer, Brats, and Bourbon for Backpack on Thursday, June 22nd. This casual, laid-back fundraiser features the best craft beer, bourbon tastings, Grilled fair, a spirited silent auction, and live music from both B Bomb Fields and the Tony Cuchetti Band. This unique event will be at FOCP's Backpack Central Warehouse. Tickets are on sale right now. Proceeds go directly to support FOCP's work feeding greater Mankato area youth. For more information and to purchase tickets right now, you can visit feedingandfueling.org. Listeners of the TF Cast get a special offer for $15 off the t full ticket price if you use the code 15 off at checkout. That's the number one, the number five, and capital O F F. See you there. All right. As, as we start to get more towards the tail end of this podcast, maybe we could talk about some of the projects that we've missed so far. Um, uh, if you have any like specific things that are going on in the area or in the greater Minnesota area that we haven't covered, uh, let's just go through those. Yeah, thank you. And um, I, I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that are really important for us. And we are not only collecting the information, also helping people to learn more about it and uh, also uh, needing the, your help, everybody's help here. In, yeah the listeners' help mm -hmm. to uh, recruit participants. And in particular, I um, want to talk about a project we, we are doing on informal economy for Latina entrepreneurs. We know that after COVID, a lot of uh, women just jump in and save the economies of the families because the husband just was fired or lost a job or lost one of their jobs, and then the economy went down. and as a response, women, and particularly in the southern area of Minnesota, came up and started selling clothes or 
food or things like that. So we are trying to figure out how to, we can help them to move from informality to formality, creating pathways for them to uh, formalize their, their businesses. And we are um, doing focus groups and interviews. So we are moving right now in the stage of uh, looking for people to participate in our focus groups. And later on in the second phase uh, for them to be part of the interviews and uh, all them coming together for the workshops we are going to be creating based on that information with local people who are going to be helping us and uh, putting their resources someplace. Like what do you need to uh, register your business? What it is important for you to know about uh, bank loans? What do you need for training purposes of your management? Things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's what we need uh, to promote. At the same time, we are doing a beautiful uh, project on justice, environmental, environmental justice, sorry. <laughs> and um, we are working with uh, perceptions on, on that issue, what it is, the, the climate change, but also how you can do some work or how can you engage on the work of saving our planet. So we are working, focusing more mostly on youth, but also families in general. And we are looking for participants. We are in all our projects offering some sort of, some sort of stipends or some uh, tokens of appreciation uh, that goes from fifteen dollars gift card to fifty dollars gift card, depending on the level of involvement from people. So mm -hmm. that is important for us. Uh, also, uh, we are having um, with Samsil, which is a South Southern Minnesota organization, looking for uh, support on special needs for disabilities among Latino communities. They work already in the area. They are serving uh, particularly uh, uh, American communities already, but we, no uh, we know very little about what are the Latino needs uh, in among disabilities. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to figure out that and uh, identifying where they are, what do they need, and how to connect them with themselves. And um, the last one I'm going to be talking about is... Um, uh, the digital, digital inclusion uh, did not less give us some so, some support for us to see how uh, the Latino community can engage more in the use of digital media uh, in this uh, internet, perhaps because so many people have no connection to the internet, mm. or perhaps equipment like a new laptop or even a cell phone or a tablet. So we mm. need to know what it is going on. So we are conducting that this uh, other exercise and um, research, and it is focusing in southern Minnesota. And one created by um, Daisy, she talked a little bit about it, is uh, what's going on the, with the bullying in the schools. Yeah, yeah so. so as I mentioned before, uh, so by being connecting with the community, I found out that this was one of the issues most parents talk about it. Uh, so, uh, as an educator as well, I got a bachelor degree in education, also master in education. So, I am really interested in all the things that we can work with the schools. Um, so, I decided to lead a project on bullying. Um, uh, we're going to be partnering with two organizations. One of them is the Mankato Clin Psychology Clinic, because we need uh, health workers to know how bullying can affect individuals, uh, their mental health. So the idea is to provide uh, parents uh, with resources of how to navigate the system and support their kids that are facing bullying in the schools because the schools' environments are different in our countries that could be here in the United States. Um, um, again, a lot of the resources, maybe they are not in Spanish or they, are, they don't know how to navigate the system because they really didn't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, also provide students, um, children with uh, social skills that help them to handle with bullying situations that don't affect their health, their mental health. You know, we are not going to start bullying situation. It's going to be a little hard to do it, but at least provide them skills and um, tools to um, avoid at some point that they get affected in the way that they have been affecting so far. So this is the idea of this project. Uh, it's going to have two phase, the phases. The first one is going to be um, uh, focus groups. So we're going to interview parents and children to know um, about these bullying situations. And also uh, we are going to provide the workshops in partnership with the two organizations. 
uh, in order to support parents and children in this. Thank you. Uh, well, we have an update for the COVID. The last update from the Minnesota Department of Health is, so there's going to be only one shot since now. At cool is the uh, Pfizer by Belland. So I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna give a short example. If you never take uh, any shot, COVID shot, you will give on, you will get only one. So it's the bivalent. It's the most um, powerful advance that we have for the that protect you for the variants. And even if you have three shots, you could get um, the bivalent after the deadline is six months after your last shot. So we offer in our clinics fifty gift card, uh, fifty dollar gift card, and yeah, that's the last update for us. Okay. Sure. Um, you, I think it was mentioned too that there was an upcoming clinic. You maybe just want to touch more on that a little bit. The upcoming oh, one. Sure. Yeah, there's one in uh, the Twin Cities in New Brighton. It's like a Venezuelan festival in Lions Park. It's the uh, next Saturday. Uh, two to five, and there's gonna be a different kind of activity, softball tournament, and we're gonna have the vaccination clinic and basic health checkups with the uh, autumn medical group as well. Yeah, okay. but also we're gonna have in partnership with Copal um, clinic here in Makedo, in, yeah. in, oh, in St. James, right? In yeah, St. James. it's gonna oh, be yeah. in St. James yeah. Yeah. on um, May 25th. We are gonna be. Uh, in partnership with COPAL, we are going to be offering vaccines, but also we are going to be offering some resources for the other organizations. And also we are going to be talking about breast cancer screening, because based on the research, a lot of women stop doing their screening during COVID um, times, you know, they don't want to go to the doctor or be around the hospital. So it's a uh, research say like is going to be maybe a possibility to increase the number of breast cancer um, patients. And so we are trying to provide these resources to women. So we're going to be talking about breast cancer screening. And also we are going to be in Fairmont on May 20, 20 mm -hmm. in the elementary school, uh, offering vaccines and also resources. Right. Cool. Thank well, you. Awesome to hear the impact y'all are having. This seems like a... Glad we could glad we could learn about it and share yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for all you do for Mankato and everywhere else around here. Just want to do plugs. Just yeah. uh, where We're, like if people want to find you online, like the website, the just support, the places where donate, volunteer, whatever oh, you yeah, need, let people know where they can connect and, and engage. Yeah, you did you said donate, please donate. <laughs> 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 That's really important. Um, we have our website in uh, www.hacer-mn.org, but we also are in almost all platforms like uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, even TikTok, and uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, of course, and uh, you can follow us there, and we do have a lot of information. And engagements are coming through many different other ways, like uh, Give Minnesota has us in uh, the website, keepminnesota.org, uh, where you can find uh, what we are doing, but also how you can support us. And if you want to connect with us, you will have the opportunity to write uh, to us to contact at hazard-mn.org or call us to 651-401-0011 or 651-401-0012. So both numbers are open for you to call and ask us whatever you, you need and um, we're always willing to collaborate with you and with everyone. Yeah, also if um, people here in Mankiro want to uh, connect with us, uh, we just open our office, well, I mean, since August last year, we open our office in Cherry Spaces. So um, the address is 127 uh, 2nd Street in Mankato. So you can find us there as well. And the phone number is 651-390-0730. And there you can hear the beautiful voice of Daisy, Daisy. instead of mine. <laughs> 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 well, thank you so much. This was really cool. I'm, uh, I'm yeah. happy to learn about that. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Y'all are clear.